Most of this is not accidental. Some of it, obviously, over time, you know, some damage would occur. But most of this is deliberate vandalism on the part of those many people who have invaded Africa, particularly the French. And I keep saying it, and I'm hoping that somebody will heed the call, particularly a young person with a lot of energy and some research skills, and will actually do serious primary research on the missing noses of African people. Can I get an amen to that? All right, let's put that out there. Look at this beautiful piece. One of the best. Now this is Amenhotep the third, Amenhotep the first, and he's the founder of my favorite dynastic period, and that's the 12th dynasty. The 12th dynasty begins about 1990 BC. It lasts about 250 years. That's one royal family, and everybody in the family was a powerhouse, men and women. But look how beautifully preserved this is. If you look at the, if you look at it closely, you can even see the dark red paint that has gradually been, um, I guess, flicked away. But look at that happy to be nappy hair. <laughs> that looks good to me. You see the pharaonic beard is very much intact. And look at this uraeus, the best uraeus I've seen, which was a symbol of divinity. So these are pieces right here in our midst that most of the time we walk right past. One of the projects I want to pursue is begin to uh, give actual tours of these various museums in Philadelphia, in Boston, in New York, and what have you. Look at this one. This one I photographed. Most of these are original photographs. So you're seeing them for the first time. I'm showing them for the first time anywhere. This is my main king. This is the number one brother for Renoko Rashidi. So if you ever do a biography on Renoko or include a chapter or a paragraph or a sentence of him in your memoirs, you can say Renoko Rashidi's favorite king from all of ancient times was a man named Namare Amenhotep III. This brother reigned for 48 years during the 12th dynasty. He had two massive pyramids constructed and he's responsible for a building that the Greeks called the Great Labyrinth, which was the largest building in ancient times. It was 800 by 1,000 feet. It consisted of 3,000 individual rooms, 1,500 built above the ground, 1,500 built below the ground. It is said that the ceiling of each one of the rooms above ground consisted of a single slab of hard granite stone that they estimated to weigh 30 tons. That's serious architectural prowess. And this is the brother who's responsible for it. He looks powerful, he looks strong, and he's got those Barack Obama ears. Now, you see these on many of the statues, these big old ears. And the idea was, the larger the ear, the more you could hear, the more you heard, the more you know, and the more you knew, the more power you would possess. And I try to push that on the students real, real, real hard. This is a beautiful piece. This is in London. I don't know who this is. He's not a king, but it's obviously a very powerful figure from Kemet, also in London, the British Museum. Now, I, go, I, I never saw a museum that I didn't want to go into, that I didn't want to explore. When I go to another country, usually the first day, right after I check into the hotel, is to the museums I go, especially the archaeological museums. I'm fascinated by them, what they put on display. But even more intriguing for me is what's not on display. Now, if this is the stuff they put on there, we know the anti-African bias that these museums have. If they look this African, what on earth is in the basements? What are the things that they are concealing from public consumption? Look at this brother right here. Now, this is for, this is a powerful one right here. I like this too. I like this because of the contrast, this old pinkish, orange facade is the uh, front of the uh, Egyptian Museum in Cairo. A museum that's so old, you know, was established in the 19th century by the French. The Egyptians, who are the, the uh, modern Egyptians who are anti-African themselves, say they're going to build a new one and it's going to be built on the Giza Plateau near Hormakit and the big pyramids there. And I like the green contrast. This is outside. Now you can't take any pictures inside the museum anymore. You got a fellow named Zawi Hawass, who is the supreme director of Egyptian antiquities, a member of the Egyptian mafia. And he exercises so much clout 
So now it's very difficult to take pictures in any other museums. There are one or two exceptions, like the Nubian Museum in Aswan, but now the big museum in Cairo with more than 200,000 artifacts, the main repository, not only can you not take pictures, you can't even take a camera inside. And now you can't take pictures underground. You can't take pictures in the tombs. You might be able to bribe somebody with a little backsheesh if you do it right, but officially you can't do that. Who is this? This is Makare Hapshatsut, the greatest of the female monarchs of Kim. And here she is in the form of what we call a sphinx. You can see the uraeus is damaged, the nose is damaged, and the pharaonic beard is completely detached. She reigned for 19 years, beginning around 1500 BC, thereabouts, and her claim was, now she was only supposed to be the regent, a kind of a temporary ruler, but once she got into power, apparently it got to be good to her, and she came up with a story that her father wasn't a mortal man, her father was God Amun, who came down from the heavens, and who impregnated her mother, and therefore gave her the right to divine rulership. So this is Makare Hapshetsut. Oh, look at this one. This is, um, I don't know who this sister is, but this is from a temple of a man named Amenhotep II. Amenhotep II was the son of Tutmos III, the mighty warrior king. My brother, is, are you working with Reality Speaks? Because this shouldn't be any other photography. All right, thank you uh, for understanding. Now, uh, Amenhotep II is the son of Tutmos III, the mighty warrior king and nephew of Hapshetsut, and he is the grandfather of uh, Amenhotep III, who was the father of Akhenaten and Tutankhamun. And apparently this is his queen. And this is from that Pichu Museum. Beautiful, beautiful piece. Now, I've never seen this in a book. There's so much art that comes out of Kemet that it's, a lot of it has not even been published that I'm aware of in books. It's just there. This is Amenhotep the Magnificent that I was talking about. This is a nice piece of him uh, in the Louvre in Paris. This is Queen Tai. This is his significant other, his wife, and the mother of Akhenaten and, and uh, Tutankhamun, the mother-in-law of Nefertiti, and this is her as a very young sister. There are more images of this sister and this brother than any other figures from ancient Kemet. Amenhotep III is so significant, he is sometimes called Amenhotep the Magnificent. He's referred to as Egypt's dazzling sun. And there are many, many images of him and his wife and queen from the 18th dynasty. There are more images of Queen Tai than any other sister from ancient Kemet, maybe from ancient times itself. This is a beautiful piece of Usamari Ramses II, also known as Ramses the Great. This is a huge, almost perfectly detailed statue, a huge statue, in a city called Memphis, which is not far from Saqqara. The statue is, um, is flat. I guess that's um, horizontal, and it's got to be close to, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's big. <laughs> it's big. I don't know what else to say. And look how perfect it is. The nose is intact, the beard is intact, the erase is there, the crown is there. Ramses the Great, he is sometimes called, and here he is again, of course, at Abu Simbel. And what good is a king without a queen, of course? I see several examples of that tonight, and it is refreshing. Poor Renoko. Maybe one day there'll be an image of him with a queen. He's working so hard. I know you feel sorry for him. Yeah, I want sympathy. This is uh, this is Nefertari. <laughs> Zama, what you shaking your head for, man? <laughs> this is Nefertari, and you could call her Nefertari. <laughs> you could call it Nefertari the Second or Nefertari the Great. The root of the word is nefer, N-E-F-E-R, an ancient Kamai word that literally means beauty. And she is the great royal wife of Ramses. Ray. Hey, brother. I'm used to seeing you with a suit and a tie, man. We have the great uh, Dr. Ray Hagens in our midst. Please give him a big round of applause. I wanted to say something, but I was too shy. And this is an Abu Simbel. Abu Simbel is the great temple of Ramses and Nefertari, deep in the desert, not far from the border with Sudan. And this is an image of a Kushite. 
Now, a lot of times we talk about Kemet, and we talk about it as though we're detaching it from the rest of the Nile Valley. Tony Browder, I think, did a very good job with that because he called his big book Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization or, or to the World, not just Egyptian, because Egypt was a part of the Nile Valley Complex, and of course the Nile Valley Complex is a part of Africa. So you have kingdoms like Kush and Kemet and Nubia and Taseti and Meroe and Napata, and sometimes you just have this broad general term, and that's Ethiopia. Look at this one of Ramses. This is at a place called uh, the Ramesseum. Not everybody goes, takes, these, uh, takes people to uh, this, this place on their tours. I always do. And you have this statue that looks so Africoid, even though it's been badly damaged. This is from the 19th dynasty. This is probably, this is a sacred lake at Karnak Temple.